And there we are. So in the top right now of your screen, over on the right where we all are, you'll see you have um, something, the blue is highlighted right now, that's us. If you go all the way over to the left and hit that left, far left single strike, we all go away. And all you have is a full screen. Did everyone get to do that all right? And that way you just see the, scry the screen, okay? Everybody okay? Well, we'll get started then. And again, I wanna thank you for being here. I think everyone in this group here, we want to be good stewards of our homes and our properties while also protecting our own family's health and also the health of the local ecosystems. And the goal of this program is to help you with that endeavor. So there's really no need for you to try to hurriedly scribble down notes because I, as Kate said, um, there is a list of resources that you've been given. And that list of resources is good because you can do the research about the issues that are really important to you and also by handing those out, it helps me as a presenter avoid overwhelming you with way too much information in one hour. Oops, let's see here. I'm speaking tonight um, as a member of Green Minds, Lake Forest, Lake Bluff, a nonprofit in Lake Forest, and Lake Bluff. Um, we are open to anyone. Our mission is to build awareness of current environmental issues and to encourage educated, sustainable practices in our community. We have a wonderful website, which I encourage you to visit. This is a screenshot. And you'll see there that we have a lot of different tabs on local environmental issues. They're important in our town and we provide a lot of different ways that you can help and get involved in those issues. If you would like to inquire about membership or if you want to attend one of our meetings, you can just call us. There's a phone number there or email us and one of us will get back to you. Green Minds also has created a free app you were supposed to just look for the Recycle LFLB in app in the, in the App Store. And this is how it appears on your screen. And you can figure out when your next recycling pickup is. You can look up your own local recycling guidelines in Lake Forest or Lake Bluff. And then you can see over on the top right, what goes where. There's a handy dandy uh, searchable database in this app. And you can type in something that, something that in your house that you're done with. You wanna clear it out. And you can find out if you can either upcycle it or recycle it or safely dispose of it. Anything from a coat hangers to styrofoam to an old saxophone. As I was preparing this presentation, it was through February and March, I was doing the research and I had enjoyed looking out the window and watching the winter resident birds at our bird feeder and in all the nearby shrubs. But by late March, those birds, their winter plumage had begun to brighten to their breeding colors and their songs began to change from feeding and flocking calls to those mating and territorial calls, especially the chickadees. And soon all of these birds are going to have their work cut out for them, searching for thousands of insects in both the caterpillar and adult stages and lots of spiders too. A pair of chickadees must find 400 caterpillars per day for their nest. That amounts to 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to raise just one clutch of chickadees. 96% of terrestrial bird species feed insects to their babies. And while they are at it, these birds are serving as ace insect controllers. Birds will starve without insects. And I'm sounding an alarm here tonight. Insect numbers are in serious decline in, in Illinois, in the US, and even around the world. And the two top causes are pesticides and habitat loss. Here, right here in Lake Forest, I am concerned about the overuse of long lasting, broad spectrum insecticides in more and more yards. These, their overuse is harming more than the songbirds. It can cause unintended collateral damage along entire food chains. And I worry about the dangers to human health of all these chemicals as well. Therefore, this presentation is going to begin with management suggestions for five commonly encountered bugs that drive most of the res residential pesticide use in Lake Forest and Lake Bluff. You can see them right there on the screen. These are the bugs that drive people to want to call a pest control service and sign up for a 12 month contract and maybe automatically re-up the next year. If you do end up feeling you need to call, keep your eyes and ears out for the most commonly used products by these pest control companies for control of these insects is going to be Masterline, Tallstar, Wisdom, or Capture. 
all of these four have bifenthrin as the active ingredient. You can see the active ingredient is highlighted in yellow. Always look for what the active ingredient is when you're trying to understand what's going to be used. Another common uh, control for ants, mosquitoes, and ticks is Termidor SC. That's very common. And Fipronil is its active ingredient. Both Fipronil and all and bifenthrin are broad spectrum insecticides. That means they kill everything. More than 70 species of insects, all spiders. They are applied in two ways. One is a perimeter treatment around the entire yard on all of the leafy vegetation that is not in flower. The, and for perimeter treatments for mosquito control, these applications are made every 21 days from early May, sometimes April, into early October on a schedule, 21 days. The other way these uh, bifenthrin and, and termidor and others are laid down is as barrier treatments. So there's perimeter and this is barrier treatments. Those go around the foundation of a house and garage and your shed. So the entire foundation up the sides of these structures and also within three feet on the ground of all vegetation around. Also every eave, every point of entry like windows, door sill and, and window wells. And for ant and spider control, these barrier treatments are sprayed in spring, early summer and fall, again, on a schedule. And in both cases, customers can call for a free application in between their scheduled applications as long as they want one and it's, there's no cost. Py right pyrethroids such as bifenthrin are the go-to choice for killing ticks, ants, mosquitoes and spiders around our yards and homes in our area. Pyrethroids are toxic to over 70 insect species and all spiders. They kill on contact and they also kill or impair insects landing or crawling on a, a sprayed surface for 10 days and more after application. Also, pyrethroids will bind tightly to soil and persist, which is good because then they're bound to the soil, but it's not good in so far as sometimes the soil is washed away from our houses and yards and gets down into storm sewers. And bifenthrin is bound tightly to that soil. So let's think about that. These, these pyrethroids that are bound tightly to the soil can then move in the runoff into our watersheds where they can persist in suspended organic matter in the water column and also in bottom sediments for months. There they are highly toxic to all aquatic insects at very low parts per billion. And stream water quality testing detects that pyrethroids in the sediments countrywide are, are at concentrations lethal to aquatic insects at the base of aquatic food chains. So my concerns are as follows, and I will let you read this slide. I'll stop talking so you can absorb the information. Go ahead. So if you end up calling a pest control service, I, a couple of hints for you. And uh, just in preparation for this program this evening, I actually cold called and made some calls as if I were an interested customer to multiple pest control companies in the area, just to let them talk and tell me what they do. One thing I heard, um, we use very little pesticides, just a few ounces per gallon of spray. Well, this is a misleading statement. A few ounces can still be dangerous. I also heard quite frequently, our product is green. It comes from chrysanthemum flowers. This is also a misleading claim. They are not using permethrin, which is made from the flowers of this particular chrysanthemum plant here photo. They are not using permethrin, they're using a synthetic pyrethroid and there's a significant distinction to be made. So this is the plant of the chrysanthemum species. It's found in the Dalmatian coasts, can also be grown around here now, this is where the product that can kill insects originally came from. I'm gonna bring up the next slide and we're gonna dig into this. So what's in a name? And this is important for you to go over. I'm spending some time on this. I'm gonna let you read this slide because then you're an educated consumer. Go ahead.
So that's a lot of P words and it took me a while to get them straight. Um, and I think if there's anything you wanna write down tonight, py pyrethrum, pyrethrins, pyrethroids and permethrin, there they all are on one slide. The pyrethrins can be used in organic agriculture because they don't have a long residual. They break down into completely harmless products. Pyrethroids are what all the pest control companies are using because they last longer and they kill more quickly and they kill longer. And permethrin is one of the commonly used pyrethroids. So let's just look, there's a lot of pyrethroids on the market, hundreds of products with them as active ingredients. On the left is just a list of some of the pyrethroids that have been created. So they kind of are like the evil daughters of the original pyrethrum, pyrethrum, which comes from a plant. These are all the evil daughters and sons that have been created over the years and they keep making them stronger. Over the years, pesticide manufacturers have gone from first generation, then to second generations, then to third generation pyrethroids. And now they're into fourth generation pyrethroids. And they've added synergists to the pyrethroids to give them increase their power. So they're not green and they're not from a chrysanthemum flower. The increased toxicity of the third and fourth generation pyrethroids in use today is not only due to their increased insecticidal activity, but it's also their greater environmental persistence and their bioaccumulation in food chains. The EPA has just not adequately addressed the registration of insecticides formulated with these combinations of these fourth generation pyrethroids and their synergists. All it says now, when you use according to label, they are considered to be safe, low risk to mammals, and they're safe for people and pets. This is also what you'll be told by pest control companies. And our applicators don't even wear masks, which is true. Well, maybe they're safe for mammals for a while or and humans, but they're not safe for insects. <laughs> and multiple studies have now proven that they can move through food chains and the bioconcentration factor can affect the actual survival of higher level predators, such as birds and fish that are exposed to them and to animals that have eaten them. And pyrethroids are now starting to show up as endocrine disruptors in animals, in animal studies. Um, there's still a lot of uncertain data about how dangerous they are to humans. There's a book about that in the resources I gave you that's the latest data on that. So here is a list I created in my own head, knowing insects of the beneficial predator insects that should be out there in our yards and that we risk killing. So a beneficial predator insect does not harm plants and they're not gonna bite you. They are predators on other insects, including pest insects. And what are those perimeter and barrier sprays repeatedly throughout their growing season doing to these beneficial predators that are helping us control pest population numbers? And for those that survive or move in later after a spray, what is left for them to eat if all the insect prey is wiped out? I would say that humans are laying a disproportionately heavy hand on the scales of a finely tuned balance between predator and prey. And it's not just about the total number of species that we stand to lose here. It's also about the ecological functions that these species can play. For example, two commonly found pre beneficial predators that you may have in your yard uh, are great in aphid controllers. The one on the left is not a bee, it's a surfid fly. And the one on the right, I hardly need to tell you that's a lady beetle. Both of their larvae, that's the larva of the surface surfid fly there in the bottom left, and the larva of the uh, lady beetles, both of them consume aphids, as does the adult lady beetle. And as a matter of fact, I think some of you may know about the uh, introduced multicolored lady beetle that flocks into endosills inside in some of our homes in the winter, and we can share some questions on how to deal with those if you'd like in the Q&A. Basically, my husband and I are really beginning to watch and enjoy seeing a marked increase in the insect diversity in our yard over the five years that we've now lived in this current place as we follow IPM and organic practices and as we plant more and more native plants. These are all photos from our yard. And on the bottom left, there's the surfid fly. And sure enough, when the pussy willow came into bloom, I found 50 of them one morning chowing down on the pollen. Boy, are they fun to watch those surfids because you know they can hover in place and then they even fly backwards. <laughs> and I was sure to thank them for the aphids I knew they'd eat. And I was pleased to see a chrysalis of a monarch later in the season. So our goal in our yard is to respect the web of life and support it. And if we have a pest insect that is going to do some damage or harm, we're gonna choose management practices that target that pest. 
in order to reduce collateral damage. And we're gonna choose products that have a short residual and break down quickly into harmless chemicals in the environment. And one thing that's really important for all of us to remember is that plants evolved to cope with some amount of chewing and sucking by insects. And matter of fact, it makes them stronger, a certain amount of it, and the healthier the plant, the better it can get through this, the sucking and chewing. I'd like to give you a one story example. One summer, um, there was a terrible outbreak of scale in all the oak trees around our yard. And the scale is an insect with a very tender body under a protective, a protective outer armor, and it sucks the phloem food moving through plants. Um, and there are numerous species of scale, but this particular summer, the scale up in the trees was just raining down this awful sticky honeydew all over our car in the driveway and all over our bluestone patio. And then there was this black mold growing on their drip, their sticky drippings. Oh, it's just really messy. But spraying an insecticide for scale can be phytotoxic to leaves on plants. It is expensive and it causes collateral insect damage. So we waited. Sure enough, first, the squirrels started eating the scale and I could watch them dangling very aerobatically from my desk window. Then a flock of cedar wax wings showed up to eat the scale. I could hear their high thin calls as they moved through the trees. And you know that scale outbreak resolved over the course of the season and it did not come back the following year and the trees were all just fine. You know, it was Gil and Leslie Smith, the owners of Arbor Smith, who suggested that I wait and watch because scale like that can come and go. And Gil and Leslie speak from experience. Their tree and shrub care company, Arbor Smith, specializes in finding non-toxic and least toxic integrated pest control management solutions. One of my biggest concerns right now is we're starting to crank up the heat in the warmer weather and mosquitoes are starting to show up. My, one of my biggest concern is the current overuse of pyrethroids in backyard barrier treatments for mosquitoes. And this can lead to mosquito tolerance of these and making it less effective. And literally Loyola University did studies right here where we live in the North Shore and they were the documented tolerance in some of the adult Culex pipians that carry West Nile virus. And then those surviving mosquitoes can pass their tolerance on to the next generation. So I'm here to say that we really must limit our use of pyrethroids in our yards for mosquitoes to times when we truly need it based on monitoring of the mosquito numbers, not on a schedule of every 21 days. Overuse will result in these products being less effective in a health emergency. We should be saving them for potential disease outbreaks. So what can we do instead? I'd like to um, let you guys read, what can we do with the mosquitoes in our yard? So I'll let you read this slide and then we're gonna dig in deeper. Go ahead. So I'll go into these now with some photos. Um, when my husband and I moved into this property, we noticed right away we had some really wet, soggy ground in the back corner, as did our neighbor. So the water would stand there after heavy rains for quite a few days. So we said, well, we got to get rid of that because that's just going to harbor mosquitoes in the summer and they could even lay eggs in a particularly wet summer. So we killed that grass, a huge area of it, 700 square feet, no, 7,000 square feet, whatever. And we sowed seeds of 28 species of native plants in the place. So that's the picture on the right that replaced the wet grass. Now all those native plants are sucking up and transpiring all that excess water. And those deep root, ex extensive root systems of the natives have opened up all the tight clay soil back there and the better infiltration of the water into the ground. We also cut down all that buckthorn that's in that picture, all stuck in the fence because standing water and wet ground under a thicket of buckthorn where no ground layer plants can grow because it's too dark, well, that can be mosquito habitat as it's either a daytime shelter or they can actually potentially breed in that damp ground. So we got rid of the buckthorn. And if you don't want to use chemicals, you can always cut a tree down, a buckthorn tree down and then cover it with a buckthorn baggie. You can buy them online. Just look up buckthorn baggies. I made my own with a contractor bag and duct tape. We left those in place for two years. There was absolutely no re-sprouting. The stump couldn't, there was no light and they died. 
So it was great. And that's now the buckthorn's all gone and the wet area is gone. We had a couple other wet spots around our yard that just are, they keep water for a few days and they're just mucky. So we decided to put in some wet tolerant native plants. On the left is star sedge, Carex radiata. It's a very kind of loose blousy look, which some people may think it's messy. I like the relaxed look. But once I'd collected seed from it, I could then chop, I could then give it a haircut with a pair of scissors, very easy if I wanted to, and put that down as a mulch on my potato crop. It makes a good clean mulch. But then on the right, look at that. Those are all wet tolerant um, cardinal flowers and blue flag iris and a big button bush, all with blooms that pollinators love. And the hummingbirds were all over the cardinal flower. This picture was taken, sorry, a little late. The, the flowers have gone by almost, but you can see a few left. So that's what we did in our wet spots. And it was, it's just very easy and I never have to worry about them again. Another thing for people who do have standing water, say you have a pond or you have a fountain or a rain barrel or a bird bath and they go away on vacation, the water's gonna sit stagnant in there. Well, then you can throw some mosquito dunks in there. You can buy them at Pasquazi's or the local hardware store. They'll do no harm to anybody else, they're not going, because they only interfere with mosquito larvae digestion. They can't, it messes up their guts. Although I will say mosquito, this, this Bacillus thuringiensis, it's a bacteria. Bacillus thuringiensis does also affect black fly larvae, which I don't think too many people are gonna worry about, <laughs> but they don't harm beneficial dragonfly and damselflies, so that's good. So they're very useful. I highly recommend them, they're safe to use, oops. But I would say, whoops, sorry. Um, that you know, if you have a healthy wetland and an ephemeral pond, if you're lucky enough to have that on your property, you probably don't need these because they're gonna be natural predators in a healthy ephemeral pond that can eat the mosquito larvae. So I would be monitoring the density of the mosquito larvae before I ever put a dunk in a natural wetland. Okay, well, the last thing I think is so important, instead of blanketing the yard, I think it's better to just cover ourselves, our own bodies. That's using a lot less product and much safer. I'm gonna start with oil of lemon eucalyptus. If you want a botanically based mosquito repellent that actually works, this is a natural product. It's derived from the leaves and the twigs of the eucalyptus citronoida tree. This is not the same as oil of eucalyptus. Very confusing. That is an essential oil. You use it for cleaning. That's later in my presentation for house cleaning. This is oil of lemon eucalyptus. There are a lot of eucalyptus species. So you want to look for that oil of lemon eucalyptus. There's also a synthetic version that they've created in a lab so they can make it on a commercial uh, basis. It's just as effective as the natural oil and it's called PMD. And PMD has now been uh, identified as just as effective in areas even with malaria to uh, help with the mosquitoes. So this is a good product for you to try. And the thing I like about it is um, that it is natural, but you cannot use it on children under three. And that's important. So what do we do about our young children? I was a camp counselor, and this is what I used on younger kids, picaridin. Uh, picaridin is the active ingredient in um, several different products. Sawyer makes one off, Ranger Ready. They all look for picaridin as the ingredient. Picaridin has a very low, I'll let you read this slide. Go ahead about picaridin. And lastly, there's always DEET. Um, and all you need is 15%. That's the, the highest percentage you'd ever need. Um, I'll let you read this slide about DEET. So you can see with DEET, you don't wanna use it on young children. And then anyone you know, around two to 12 years old, you've gotta use a lower percentage and put it on more, only three times a day. So that's why I think Picaritin for me is the safest for a, a young family, if that's of your concern to you. Let's also remember that these mosquito repellents are also tick repellents. And I think that's really important to not worry and have to spray your entire property for ticks. Um, that's a lot of material to be spraying, um, but I do believe that ticks need to be, I understand there's a concern. I am very aware 
that tick-borne disease incidents are on the rise in the United States. And I also am aware that one half of all the counties in the US have now had reported cases of Lyme disease. When I was a child, Lyme was so rare. So I am aware, I've been to some conferences about this, so I understand that we do have to be careful about ticks and I take them seriously because I work around them. So let's go through them that are the ones we're gonna find in our area. And you may already know this, but a review is good. The wood tick is also called the dog tick. This is a female. She's wearing what would be called an apron or a skirt and the male has suspenders, two little white stripes on either left and right of his shoulders. The other one, and this one does not carry Lyme disease. So the wood tick, they're pretty common. You're often gonna find them, but they don't carry Lyme. The deer tick, also called the black-legged tick, is smaller than the wood tick and it does carry Lyme disease. And then the last one on the right, the lone star tick um, is rare still in our area, but it has finally made its way here. And the lone star in Lake Forest and the lone star does carry Lyme and it does also carry Rocky Mountain spotted fever. So yes, I recommend repellents. But I also um, know some of us, I, for example, I'm a land steward um, in, for the Lake County Forest Reserve District and Lake Forest Open Lands. And so I know I'm going out in areas where there are a lot of mosquitoes and ticks. So I'm gonna dress carefully when I do that. And I, I just know better. And if any of you really wanna be as cautious as I am in your own yard, you can send some of your work clothes away to insectshield.com. Um, it's there on the top, but you also can read a lot more information on the website. And this is all in the resources I sent you today, but you can send your own clothing away or you can buy some at a camping supply store that have been treated by Insect Shield. And what that is, yes, it's a synthetic pyrethroid. The clothes are, um, they put in permethrin into your clothing, but here's the scoop. It is so tightly bound to the fabric that it stays there. And to the point where it stays so long, you can wash it 70 times and it's still there. So they, that why they picked the number 70? Because they had to pick a number for their label. It basically, it stays in the fabric for the lifetime of the fabric. So it's not going anywhere and you don't wear it right close to your, your skin, your bra and your underwear, no, it's outer layers. Also great idea if you have a dog that you like to have outside, you can send away a large piece of fabric or a bandana if you have a little dog or a jacket for your dog and they will treat it at Insect Shield and send it back to you and then your dog won't be bringing ticks into the house. And when I led programs for open lands, every kid knew in spring that we would all tuck our pant legs in our socks and we tucked in our shirts and we all did a tick check halfway through the program and at the end and everybody was fine. And this is important to me. I think it's important for every child to know how to feel safe in the outdoors and to enjoy without fear. You just have to know how to take care of yourself. And yes, we put insect repellent around everybody's ankles and waist. So all of this, I don't treat whole areas for ticks. I treat myself, I blanket me, not a whole yard. The other thing I will say for those of you who are really worried about Lyme and boy, you should be, during the nymph season, that's when they're in their tiniest, teeniest little earliest instar stage, the deer tick nymphs are so small, you can't even see them. They're really hard to find. And May and June is deer tick nymph season. During that season, if I've been out working in open lands or the County Forest Reserve District, well, the minute I come home, I strip off all my clothes and I throw them all in the dryer put them on for about a good 10 minutes and that completely desiccates the ticks and kills them because they're very susceptible to desiccation. You don't wash your clothes because the ticks will make it through the wash cycle and still be crawling on your clothes. So there you go, how to protect yourself from ticks without having to kill every other insect at the same time. And I really think this is gonna get important because people are starting to freak out about Lyme disease for good reason. You can also go ahead and invest in a pair of gaiters. You saw mine that I was wearing in my picture, dress for success, but you can buy these that I have. And then also you can buy them. They're already tick repellent in them already and wear those. If you're gonna be walking your dog through an area where you think there might be ticks, you just have these in your car and put them on your legs when you go for a walk. I, I'm a big believer in gators. The other thing I think is really good for people to know about, especially if you have some woods in your area, in your backyard or a woody margin is the, therm is the tick tubes. These are also in the resources of how to use them, but I'm gonna let you read this slide as a good tick controller in your yard. Go ahead.
So mice are the principal reservoir for the spirochetes that cause Lyme disease. And it's important to get to the ticks on the mice to help us break this Lyme infection disease cycle. And mice are the principal reservoir because one, they spend so much time on the ground in the woods where the deer ticks are hanging out. Two, mice are abundant. Three, mice are not fastidious groomers. And four, their bodies do not mount a strong immune response to the spirochetes in their blood. So mice are referred to as quote unquote, a competent reservoir for Lyme disease. And you know, a lot of people don't know it, but the American robin is also a competent reservoir for Lyme disease. They're common and they're on the ground. Here's a fellow or a gal who is an incompetent reservoir. Here's a case where it's a good thing to be incompetent. <laughs> and Kate, you're gonna smile because you have one of these in your yard. I will let you guys read this slide. I think it's their opposable thumb that makes them such good groomers. But you know, I know people who are freaked out by when they see a possum and they'll call a pest control company to come and trap the possum and take it away. But if you were, if you were removing a an opossum from a neighborhood, you are then just increasing the chance for the spread of Lyme disease. Why? Well, because all those ticks of the opossum would have killed, redistribute themselves on other hosts, hosts that are not as good at picking off and eating every tick. So I see opossums as a backyard ally, not to be feared, but you just wanna keep them out of the chicken coop, of course. One last comment for you all about safer alternatives to the pyrethroids for mosquito control and tick control. I'm sure you may have already seen this or you're sure to be seeing cedar oil and garlic oil based products for sale. Um, and I think they, the high number of these on the shelves is just reflecting customers' hope for safer insects and they, insecticides. And yes, they're botanically based. Yes, they have a short residual, but nonetheless, they're still pesticides. And when you put them all over your yard, they're gonna kill whatever they hit. The other thing about them is I've talked to a lot of people and they're just really not that effective. And you're gonna have to do repeated applications. So here I are hitting insects again and again, all for limited efficacy for the mosquito and the ticks. So. If you really feel like you need a barrier treatment or excuse me, a perimeter treatment in your yard for ticks or mosquitoes, I would recommend that you try one that is a national organic program compliant. It's called Essentria. And um, this is active ingredients. You can see right there, rosemary oil, geranium oil, and peppermint oil. This is the gold standard for sensitive clients like zoos and healthcare facilities. That said, it is still a broad spectrum in pesticides and kills a lot of different insects. So I would consider Eccentria a, what I'd call a least worst choice. If you really feel like you like are having a party and you wanna do some mosquito fogging for your guests, I just, it's, it is plant-based and it breaks down to harmless chemicals, which will not persist in sediments and harm our local waterways. I just don't use any of these products myself. I've never, I'm trying to give you products I've used. I'm full disclosure, I don't use any of these because I don't like to use broad-based perimeter and barrier treatment. So I just think it's really important for us as consumers to ask pest control companies and garden supply stores to please carry safer alternatives for insect management. And I think consumer demand drives positive change. And I just really avoid that blanket statement I hear from people, quote unquote, I don't like chemicals. Because you know, organic products are chemicals. Every product is a chemical. So it's just important to ask good questions when looking for pest management. I'm gonna wrap up pyrethroids with something that I see all too often, and that is people hiring pest control companies to spray their entire house and their garage and all the shrubs around their house for spider control because they don't like spider poop on their house paint and they're freaked out by spiders in general. And I just think using a long telescoping handled brush to remove all the web building spiders in their egg cases is much safer for the environment and your own health. And you, if you don't wanna do it yourself, Sydney Services will provide house brushing service right there in Lake Bluff. Um, we do our own brushing two or three times a summer, particularly up in our house in Michigan where there are a lot of spiders and that's in a two-story house. And I just reach out the open windows, the second story. I will tell you, I don't know how many of you have seen this. Every fall I see Miss Muffet's Revenge. 
in hardware stores and garden centers. It's a very cute name, but it is not a cute product. We all know who Miss Muffet was, um, but the active ingredient is bifenthrin. And it, they get it out there because I don't know about you, but we see that black creepy spider in our closets and racing across the bedroom floor at night, right before you turn the light out and you're like, oh. And I think people are just so freaked out by that, they're gonna use Miss Muffet's revenge. Keep spiders inside, kill spiders inside and keep spiders out. I would never use this inside my house, it's by Fenthrin. And I, the whole thing of wet and forget, that really bothers me, that kind of thinking. Um, you're killing everything when you use this. And bifenthrin is not all that benign um, to the ecosystem. Uh, so, and wouldn't you know, they have to show the Black Widow just to scare us all on their label. All right, so from our houses into our yards, another really common complaint by suburban people, and I hear about it all the time in Lake Forest and Lake Bluff, is people worried about grubs in their lawn because they're worried that they're gonna turn their lawn spots brown. The schools were having trouble with grubs in their athletic fields the other year and they asked Green Minds what to do. So grubs are around. Um, so let's talk about grubs. Uh, and I think it's important to know, one, that not all grubs are a threat to your lawn. For example, in my compost pile, I have these huge, fat, thick, transparent grubs that have transparent skin and they're really scary looking, but they're breaking down the compost and they're never gonna eat, bother my lawn. So all beetles start out as grubs. So there are just four species of beetle larvae that in the Midwest that feed on white and grass roots. And these are known as AKA white grubs. The one on the left is the Japanese beetle. The one on the right is the chafer. Those are the two most common. And uh, it's, the other thing to remember about these grubs is it's absolutely inevitable. You are gonna have grubs, white grubs chewing grass roots in a lawn. So the real issue is at what grub density are you at risk of losing parts of your lawn? That is the question to ask. Chances are in a healthy lawn, natural predators will keep these grub numbers in check. Those predators include skunks and squirrels and crows and flickers. Chances are you do not need to apply a grub insecticide, especially like a lot of people do once every year as a preventative measure. As a personal story, I'll share with you. I was called early one morning by a lawn care service guy uh, because he knows I am the steward of a large grassy piece of land used for occasional parking in a natural area in Michigan. So this guy says, you know what? You've got a really bad grub problem in this lawn. You're gonna lose the grass. So he, I said, okay, well, what are you going to put on it? He said, I'm going to, I would recommend a loft. I said, all right, well, let me think about it. I'll get back to you. So I knew I wasn't going to do this. I wanted to kind of push him a little bit. So I looked up what a loft is. It's an insecticide with two pyrethroids. That's that combination I was telling you about. And it has a four month residual. This is in a natural area in the woods. So I sent a golf course manager who I trust up to the parking area to check in the lawn grass there. And he said, no, 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 you don't need to treat. You do not even have a problem. Yes, you have grubs, but your grub numbers are well within normal. So there you go. That's a good case study. So white grubs will cause limited damage to turf grass. Their populations um, are over five grubs per square foot. So there's actually a way of counting to see if you have a problem. This is all in the resources I've sent you. And if the populations exceed that threshold, you first want to identify which grubs you have, and then you want to tailor your control strategy for the grub species that you do have in your lawn. It's pretty easy. There are only four. It's all on the internet. Okay, I have three suggestions for grub control that are biological controls that I would say are safe for us, for our, our purposes this evening. And I want to tell you, I've never used any of these myself because I rely on natural predators and my own healthy grass is fine. But this is what I learned in my research and talking to other people, a lot of other people about this because it's so common and the schools ask green minds. Okay, the first one is beneficial nematodes. You can buy them, for example, from Arbico Organics. That's a wonderful place for you to go online. It's in the resources. And I am comfortable with beneficial nematodes because nematodes occur naturally in the soil and these, um, these nematodes will take care of all four species of white grubs in lawn. It, the best time to apply it is when the soil is warm in the late summer and the grubs are large. So like mid-August, generally two applications, seven to 10 days apart, it's gonna work. Uh, so it's 
bear in mind though, these nematodes are not specific to white grubs that are on the grass roots. They're gonna seek out some 60 species of soil insects in larval and pupal form. So it's all about this predator prey balance and how to treat to best maintain that balance. So you can think about it if you really have a big issue and they'll work, they'll, they won't all last in the soil after you put them on. They may do their first job and some of them die out. You get back to that balance. The second one that you may have heard about is milky spore, is a biological control. It's a bacteria, and I'm comfortable with this one because it, as a bacterial treatment, is specific to, targeted to the Japanese beetle grub. It's the only grub that controls, though. It won't take out those other three. And it has to be, it had some other drawbacks. It has to be applied three times, spring and summer and fall, for two consecutive years for that bacteria to get established in our soil. And even then it may not establish in our zone five and then you may have to do repeated applications to make it work because our winters are kind of cold. It really does work better in zone seven to 10. For example, it doesn't even work at all in Vermont. Um, but a lot of people try it. And by the way, I should mention that Japanese beetles were accidentally released in the US in 1916. And biologists went back to Japan to have to find a natural predator that evolved along with this beetle. And thus they came back with milky spore bacteria. Okay, the last of the biological controls for grubs is newer product, not out, hasn't been out that long, grub gone, G. And it is another bacillus thuringiensis. That was what we had in our mosquito dumps. It's a bacteria. This one is the strain uh, Galleriae BTG. So it's a strain of bacillus thuringiensis that is specific to beetle grubs. It is harmless to mammals and birds and amphibians, but I have read it is just not quite as effective for Japanese beetles. So the verdict is still out on, on grub be gone. You know, and our lawn has a fair, its fair share of beetle grubs, but it's taking the grubs in stride with the help of skunks. So I focus on the adult beetles and let the skunks go for the grubs. The um, adult beetles will start to emerge from the soil in uh, late July, excuse me, late June and early July. And I get right on it. As soon as I see them, I go out with my bucket of soapy water and I knock them into the bucket. And um, I also start to lay off on the water of the lawn in um, July and August because when the, after they've mated, they lay their eggs in your lawn. And if the lawn is dry, the eggs will desiccate. So I just lay off on watering. Um, and I just hand pick them. They're easy to find because they are groupies. They tend to congregate and feed and mate all in a big cluster. It's rather gross. And they're so, they're easy to find. But I do not recommend the use of pheromone traps to attract and kill Japanese beetles. You can find these at all the garden centers. These, they say they're gonna save you from the Japanese beetles. These traps have been found to actually attract Japanese beetles to your yard from neighboring properties. And the beetles end up joining another congregation of beetles already in your yard because those groupies are already emitting their pheromones and they go over there first and never make it to the trap. So they just join into a mating frenzy already underway. So I wouldn't recommend those traps. And you know, we see a lot of skunk digging in our lawn in the fall. And we know the skunks are eating the Japanese beetle grubs, so we let them at it. And the turf actually self repairs just fine. And we also overseed our lawn in October anyway, so it all works out just fine. So thank you for listening to all that. I mean, if you don't have a problem with lawn grubs and there's not your pet peeve, but you never know, you may be able to pass this information along to a friend and that's important too. I think a really compelling case against this annual applications of grub insecticides like Aloft or Scott's Grub-X I, I, is about the other beneficial insects that live in the soil. I think we all love to see fireflies. I do in my yard in the summer. Well, there's the larva in the top left and the pupa of the, of the firefly and the adult firefly in the bottom. The larva and the pupa are soil dwelling. They will be killed by the pyrethroids and other types of chemicals used in these grub sides. And then there's the solitary bees which we really need as pollinators. Um, they, many of the solitary bees, actually most of them are soil dwelling insects. They have their nests in the soil, they raise their, their babies in the soil and we're going to be killing them if we're using these grubicides. And a lot of people are using these grubicides. 
As a matter of fact, 50% of the native bees in Northern Illinois, many of them ground nesting, have completely disappeared over the last century. And many of those native bees were specialist pollinators that co-evolved with certain native plants. And the flowers of those plants are just not going to set seed without their pollinators. I will never forget Laura Riker's comments at a lecture I heard from her. Laura is the co-author of the most recent edition of the Flora of the Chicago region. And Laura has documented the insect associates of all the native plant species in our flora. It's a remarkable body of work. At the end of her presentation, Laura said, quote, mark my words, many if not most of these insects I have just described to you will be extirpated in our lifetime. And most of them aren't even found in guidebooks yet. In addition to um, protecting our ground nesting bees, we also need to think about providing nesting habitat and protection for other kinds of native bees that live in plant stems, particularly hollow plant stems. And I've taken a picture here um, of some plant stems I left. It's very simple to create nesting habitat for beneficial insects that live in plant stems. You just leave some of them standing and uncut when you clean up your garden in the fall. Just leave a good 12 inches standing. And also, if you do want to cut some of your yard so it's not all stemmy, you just leave some of those cut stems on the ground in place. And then in the spring, don't do that spring cleanup until mid to late April. You need to wait till the temperatures have risen and give those native beneficial insects in your stems and your leaf litter that overwintered is pupa or eggs, give them time to emerge from their winter resting and get going. And I think it's also really, so you can see I have, look at all the wonderful holes I have from those plant stems <laughs> when I finally took them down. They obviously were being housing for somebody. I also want to just bring up in spring, and this is when everybody's putting down the mulch. And I, it's very attractive, that hardwood tree mulch, but it is not good habitat for native insect pupa. They can't complete a metamorphosis in a three to four inch layer of shredded wood mulch. Chopped leaves from our own native trees right here in our town. Chop leaves are the best mulch and you can have it home delivered to your home by DK Organics. A nice big pile of clean, weed-free chopped leaves for a mulch. I also want to close on the bees to say, I have a mixed feeling about those cute bee hotels that people are very popular in garden supply stores these days. Um, I think the, the intention is good. Um, but the bigger hotels can turn multiple bee larvae into sitting ducks, easy picking for predator wasps. And also diseases can spread from one year to the next because it's hard to clean that out. So if you do hang up a bee hotel in your yard, the smaller the better so as not to, to attract predator wasps that will lay their eggs inside each and every hole and kill every single bee larvae. So there's more on that in our resources. So in closing here I, about insects, I just, this is a sampling of some of the stuff you can go to that you'll find in the resources. I mentioned the Arbico Organics and see you can just click on control by pest and you'll have all their answers of how to do biological control. How easy is that? And the University Extension, your tax dollars at work has a wonderful bug review. You can search by name or you can search by where are the insects found to figure out what to do, what it is. The National Pesticide Information Center is invaluable. It has a total database, a database on pest control and a database on every chemical. So if you want to know what the chemical is that's in the active ingredient, you can go there and look it up. Uh, another, uh, excuse me, another resource I've given you in the resources is ourwaterourworld.org. And see here's a list of less, and you can just look up by insect pests, less toxic products for managing each of the following pests. Lots of things out there for you to do besides picking up and calling a pest control company. So, you know, speaking about lawns, when you're doing the grubs, um, I think it's really a good idea for us this evening also to talk about environmentally safer alternatives for broadleaf weed control in lawns. Big issue in our town. You know, I have to say, I've come to accept that where there is lawn, there will be weeds. And I cannot even hope to do justice right now to lawn care practices with the time we have here, but I am very happy to answer any specific questions during Q&A because I do have a lot to say about this topic. What I do wanna just say here to everybody 
over time, reduce the amount of turf on your property and replace it with native plants and leaf mulch. This is gonna reduce you fussing over weeds and the need for herbicides. And there's such a wide variety of native plant ground covers and low growing natives from which to choose now. There's one for every situation, wet, dry, shade, sun. It's fun. These are two areas in our yard, one right on the sidewalk, one in front of our door that we have put in natives no more. And we're so happy there, so beautiful. Also, simply stop mowing under some of your trees. It's kind of a nice pastoral look. This is a friend's yard. I think it's rather attractive and she's saving gas too. And I think keeping the lid on weeds is really the goal here. It's not total weed control, which you're gonna get with a true green product of tree green service, spray service. Your, your goal is gonna be management, not total control. And management, especially before those weeds drop their seeds into the soil and then sit there as a seed weed seed bank. We do a lot of hand pulling of weeds in our yard, but when there are just too many to keep up with, then we will spot spray those weeds. And we're gonna always start with an organic product. And the two I'm recommending tonight are Fiesta or Weed Beater FE. These are both high in iron so the iron messes with dicots, which think about broadleaf weeds, but it does not bother monocots, think grass. And also really important, weeds do not develop resistance to these kinds of this mode of action because weeds have developed resistance to glyphosate. 23 of them in the agriculture are now super weeds because they've gotten resistant to overuse. They cannot develop resistance to Fiesta or weed beater high iron. So that's another part of IPM to bring out here tonight. When we moved in, we had a horrific problem with black medic. That is the plant on the left, excuse me, on the right. Um, and it just can sprawl out over a foot wide toupee within one year. It has these little gangling arms and it creates a lot of seed. So I use Fiesta and in this picture, I brought this picture. This, this doesn't always happen when I use Fiesta, but I wanted to show it. Sometimes Fiesta can turn the yard a little black and people complain about that. Well, I probably over applied here a little bit because as I said, it's really hard to get total coverage on Black Medic because it sprawls. So I had to put down a lot of product. And also you really only want to use uh, Fiesta or Weed Beer FE in the spring or the fall when it's cool. You don't want to use them on hot summer uh, when the grass is more stressed, but they're very effective and the school system is actually using Fiesta and a couple places now to try it. I really feel good about when I'm out there spraying with Fiesta or weed beater because I don't have to worry about the amphibians in my yard um, and knowing I'm not going to hurt them. I think it's really important for everybody to know that um, we need to talk about the inert ingredients and in some of the synthetic herbicides that uh, lawn care companies use. In herd ingredients, um, the active ingredient is the, is the pesticide that kills the plants and that gets all the attention, but the inert ingredients are the surfactants, the stickers, the spreaders that are added to herbicides to make them stick to plants and penetrate the outer layer of plants. And um, most surfactants in synthetic lawn herbicides are lethal or what's called sublethal, meaning they, they over time kill them, sublethal to all amphibians. And these surfactants are hard. Some of them are very hard on tree and shrub roots. And they're also hard on the mycorrhizal fungi, the beneficial fungi in the soil. And some of these surfactants can persist for years in the tree roots. And they can even cause bark cracking in some fruit trees. And now it's be, data is beginning to show that these surfactants are sublethal to pollinators that are exposed to them. So these surfactants are not well regulated. They need more scrutiny. I was troubled when I saw a lawn care applicator one day when I was out for a walk on a rainy day and the, he was spraying in the rain. I walked over and I said, excuse me, isn't it illegal for you to apply in the rain? Isn't that contrary to the herbicide label instruction? And his answer was, oh, no, no, this is new. Our company is a new surfactant that allows us to spray in the rain. Don't worry, it won't, even, it won't wash off with this surfactant. So that worried me because I know about surfactants. So I called the company and asked about this new surfactant. What is it? And I was told, oh, no, 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 it's proprietary. And they would not disclose it. That worried me. Oop, sorry. So I think 
it is possible that you may end up applying a synthetic herbicide at some point to get on top of runaway weed problem, it's possible. And I say this because I really understand the reality of maintaining large areas of grass in Lake Forest and Lake Bluff. Um, you know, maybe you bought a property uh, with full of weeds and weed seeds, or maybe your neighbor's fig buttercup has invaded your lawn, or maybe you need to maintain peace with your significant other. So if you have to use synthetic herbicides, I would recommend trying spot treatment first or just hire a lawn care company for maybe two years to get on top of the weeds and then go back to natural lawn care from there on in. A few pointers to keep in mind if you do end up having to use a lawn care service, and I'm gonna let you read this slide of what to think about if you are hiring a lawn care service. Oops, I'm sorry, <laughs> excuse me. So for, to me, the two takeaways here are a lot of people don't tell their person mowing their lawn that it was just sprayed and not to bag that. It's not good for the person handling the clippings and they shouldn't be saved and put in compost. So there you go. Until that stuff has, the herbicide has time to break down the presence of air and sunlight on your grass. Very important. Most people don't know that. Also, I do not believe this safe when dry. That is what the lawn care industry got lobbied hard for. I wait for whatever the safe reentry is for agricultural use on the label. It's usually 24 to 48 hours for most of these products. I wait that long before I go out there and do any kind of weeding or play, or especially kids or pets. All right, so um, I do wanna talk a little bit about weed control in gravel um, parking areas and gravel park, um, gravel uh, patios and also pavers and bluestone fat because I think I see a lot of people spraying right now to get on top and I know they're spraying um, glyphosate. It's just the go-to. Um, I These are the three that I use um, in cracks. We have a lot of old pavers um, and a lot of gaps. So we have a lot of weeds in our pavers. These are the three I've used all with success. Um, the Tria says it kills to with, get some root kill kind of, yes or no. Some of the tougher weeds like dandelion, they've got a picture, can grow back after you spray. So you got to hit it again, maybe two or three times, but you're knocking that weed way back. It doesn't have as much seed and it's easier to hand pull, which is a good thing. Horticultural vinegar, you have to order it online. Um, and I have that in the resource where to get it. It smells like you're making Easter eggs, but it's very effective. And then burnout. Um, this one, I used to use it a lot when it, the earlier formulation a few years ago smelled like cloves. It was kind of nice. This is nice. This is a newer formulation that is actually far more effective and you, you need less of it to, when you're mixing it in your backpack sprayer, but it smells really bad, um, but it works. So all three of these you can get easily. And speaking of burnout, um, I know that some people do use a propane torch to kill weeds in, in pavement. Um, and I think in Europe, some places that's all they're allowed to use. I, I have not tried it. I, I'm sticking with these or hand weeding, but I know that probably can work. And somebody wants to talk about that Q&A, great. And I have to say, I was just in a, a conference for alternatives to glyphosate um, on Zoom. And I learned about what's coming onto the market now is a foam steamer. It's so cool. It cooks weeds with hot water that's delivered in this biodegradable foam that insulates the heat and makes it kill the weeds. And it's actually now being tried out um, currently in the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh and the University of Wisconsin Stout. They're using these foam steamers. This is a product out of England. And I don't think we're gonna be seeing this for residential use, but maybe landscaping companies may start to offer this someday. And I think that's good because we, what we ask for, they'll start using more. <laughs> so all, while we're talking about pavers, which we have a lot of, many people may have paver, pavement ants under their pavers. We do. You probably see the dust mounds, I mean the sand mounds. This is what the ant looks like close up. So what do we do about that? We leave them to a certain extent, but if it gets really unsightly and kind of out of control, which it does sometimes, I will just sprinkle some diatomaceous earth right along the crack line and just use a little toothbrush to just quietly dip it down to where the ants are in and out. Very simple to do. I'm gonna let you read this slide about diatomaceous earth. Oh, 
desktop. The other outdoor ant product is a taro product. Um, it is sweet sticky with some borax, also called sodium terborthite, uh, active ingredient. And the borax just messes with the ant's digestion. And um, it's very safe uh, for anyone who a mammal would try to eat it. It's just borax, uh, but it's deadly to the ants in their guts. Um, and that you can buy their little bait traps and put them around outside outdoor taro. Also, their taro also makes ant killer though. You need to look at the active ingredient on the label. This ant killer is a taro product, but it has a pyrethroid, lambda cyhalothrin as the active ingredient. Very different. It uses a barrier treatment around the perimeter of a house. You can see the yellow line. Very different product. Always look at the active ingredient before you buy, just because it says taro. Um, we also use taro inside. We live on a slab. Our house is built on a slab, so we have pavement ants are also called slab ants that emerge in the winter sometimes. And I know a lot of my neighbors do too because I see the uh, pest control companies in, in winter all around our neighborhood and I know they're going for ants. People don't like them in their kitchen. I understand that. So when ants come out of our slab and into our house, I bring out comes the taro and you can buy the little plastic bait and put it down like it's on the top right there or you can buy uh, drops and put them on a piece of cardboard and they line up like piggies at a trough and they take that liquid sticky bait with the borax, they suck it into their guts and they dr drive it back into, they carry it back into their colony where they then feed it to the rest of the colony, hopefully including the queen. And they do in the whole colony. So you don't kill the ants, you bait them and let them carry the borax to their colony. And after about three days of action, usually the action dies down. At that point, I lift the, remove the bait and I may use a little diatomaceous earth in the crack if I can easily get it down into the crack to stop that being used as an entry for my pavement, my slab ants under our house. Uh, the little black ant is the other one that also can live in homes and comes up. And a friend of mine has them in her yard, in her home. I have paper, slab ants, she has little black ants. I'll let you read the slide. Carpenter ants are not little black ants. They are big black ants and liquid baits do not work for them. Carpenter ants do not carry bait back to their colony. Forget using them uh, for carpenter ants. Carpenter ants, you gotta find, they're telling you you have rotting wood somewhere, either a rotten tree stump or you have rotting windowsills. Something is where they're gonna go in and tunnel into that to create chambers for their young. The only way to get rid of carpenter ants is don't call a pest control company, which most people do, get rid of the rotting wood. That's the source of the problem. Once you've got rid of the rotting, rotting wood, you'll find the ants in there and out they go. And then you also need to find their, their satellite nests that are gonna be out in the ground near the rotting wood. They make them some satellite nests in the ground. You just dig into that nest a little bit with a shovel and out boil up all the ants. You just sprinkle in the diatomaceous earth and that's the end of the satellite comp. Um, colony. And we have never had to call a pest control company. We've had carpenter ants in two houses we bought and we took care of it by getting rid of the, the rotting wood. So we've been going for an hour and I need to wrap up for q and I'm nowhere near finished. So I'll probably stop in a minute here and turn it over to you guys um, and see if you, some of you want to keep going. Uh, I just want to say here, it's really a good idea to get a hand lens and identify that insect. It's positively relevatory to look at an insect pest under a hand lens. It really lets you see that other life form that you're trying to figure out what to do with and how it lives. And I, it just opens your eyes. And if you have kids, it's a great learning experience. I can't live without my hand lens. I would never use a hand lens for a bald-faced hornet nest, a bald-faced hornet, however. And this is an insect that many people freak out when they see that big nest. They absolutely right away call the pest control company and they're told, oh my gosh, that's a very dangerous, very dangerous wasp. They're not really hornets, they're wasps, bald-faced hornets. They're beneficial insects 
they will not bother you if you don't get close to that nest. We, this nest here is a picture we had in a tree right by our back door. I watered and weeded right under that nest. I went in and out of that door a hundred times during the summer, never was bothered. But I did see the bald-faced hornet in my garden working up and down the kale and the broccoli going after the green caterpillar from the cabbage moth butterfly and taking them back to provision their young in their nest. So they're beneficial insects. As a matter of fact, wasps are some of the best beneficial insects we've got. Another native wasp is the paper wasp, another beneficial insect I would see in my garden working on those green caterpillars on my kale. They will make also make a paper nest out of wood, uh, but these guys can sting pretty hard if you get close enough to their nest. And we have them in our chairs where we sit underneath the chairs and they sting us. So we have to kill them. And we just use EcoSmart. It's just a peppermint oil spray, totally safe, it breaks down within to harmless ingredients, but the oil saturates the, the nest and the adults and does them right in. You have to wait till nighttime when they're all back at the nest holding on and asleep. Don't do it during the day because you'll get some coming back getting angry and wondering what happened and flying all around and angry enough to sting. So you do it at night. Same thing goes for yellow jackets. Got to wait to find where they are going in and out of their nest and they may be in an eave um, in your house going in and out. They may be by your front door in a hole or they may be a, in a nest in the ground right near your compost pile. These are cavity nesting insects. Yellow jackets are not native. Like the Japanese beetle, they were released by mistake and they were actually released from a lab, these guys, and they have now become a complete menace and they get very aggressive in the early um, fall and late summer. So I have no fe bad feelings about killing them. And I wait till nighttime and I go out and I puff diatomaceous earth into the hole. And um, if they're right in a spot where I need them to die like fast because I have a husband who's allergic to bee stings or if I'm teaching a school program and they're right by the wetland where I'm gonna be leading kids, there's a ground nest, I will pull out the permethrin and puff that into the hole. But again, it's just right down into that nest. It's a very specific use and I only do it at night. All right, I'm going to stop sharing and because it's been an hour, <laughs> I didn't get through it all. I knew I wouldn't, but um, I think we should kind of open up the floor here for questions. Okay, first of all, I'm gonna just read, there's some questions from the chat. I'm okay. gonna read out some of these questions and, uh, and that will give people some and time to kind of formulate the questions and they can raise their hand or unmute themselves and then talk to Marion directly, okay? First question from Barbara. Can you uh, recommend an alternative to Roundup for weed control? Yeah, so that's what I was trying to get at. Roundup, in my presentation, Roundup is a non-selective herbicide. That means it kills every plant it hits, both broadleaf and monocot. So it kills everything. So it's really only, you can't use it in your lawn, obviously, because it'll kill the lawn. You can only use it for things like cracks in the pavement or in gravel. And that's where I gave you the natria. Okay, everything okay? You had to unmute yourself, Kate. I know, I can't get my hand to go away. Okay, so that's where I was trying to, it's an alternative glyphosate, the natria and the, uh, or natria, and the burnout and the horticultural vinegar are very successful. That's what I use. I have my own backpack sprayer and I mix it myself, saves me money. And I feel very safe with all three of those and they are pretty effective. Nothing kills like glyphosate. I mean, <laughs> I have to hit more than once with those organics, but I'm much safer with them and I don't mind hitting more than once. So that is what I use. And I talked a little bit about that foam uh, steamer that's going to be out more and more in the product. Look for that in the future. Um, and then some people use a propane torch. Does that answer your question about alternatives to glyphosate? Can I also ask about gut weight? Control. Gutweed, yes, I am a big, I had gutweed and I tried so hard to take it out by hand. I was determined, I spent a year, I kept letting it come back, I dig it again for an entire year, I cleansed an area, it still, and then I put in really expensive native plants, it still came back. You cannot dig out 
got wheat, because you're always going to leave little pieces and it's always going to come back. Why they ever introduce that as a ground cover, I don't know, because it's really dangerous. So here's what you do. You ready? You mm -hmm. pick it. You got to get crafty when you want to be organic. You smother it and you cover it and you trick it into coming up to the surface going, hey, who turned out the lights? So either you get a really thick mulch of hay and leaves, but what I do is I buy Weed Pro Barrier from Johnny Seeds or just other online. It's a very heavy duty fabric. It is polypropylene, it's plastic, but it lasts. I lay it down, I mow that got weed down and I lay that plastic down and I leave it there for a year. And Kathy Carolyn's sitting here, she did this at her home. I think Kathy, you're here. Mm -hmm. And you leave it. And a year later, you peel back that black weed pro barrier and all of, lo and behold, all the gout weed has come up to the surface. It's like spaghetti noodles and you just pull it out. And then I put it down for a whole nother year. I'm a real purist and I just put pots on top for a while. And then, or you can make, you can put it back down and make big X's and put in big, beautiful hostas or big, beautiful shrubs. Or you can wait two years and do the same and then just remove it. And then you clean the area pretty much of the rhizome. If there's any that comes back, it's still so weak and so easy to get that you can use an herbicide to knock it back. Okay, thank you. It's, it's a, I've spent many hours on gut weed. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> so much. There's another question. Can you use coffee grounds to fertilize your garden? Yes, coffee grounds are high in nitrogen. They're also acidic for our alkaline soil. Um, I actually just add them to the compost because they make my worms wake up smell the coffee and turns them right on. They love coffee <laughs> and they're so happy with coffee grounds and tea grounds. So I had a friend of mine when I was the director at Elowa who would go to the Starbucks in Lake Bluff and bring me the coffee grounds once a week. Oh, did we have happy worms in our compost? So <laughs> yes, on your, um, right into your garden or I really am a big advocate for compost because it is just a two plus two equals six with compost. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And uh, from Greg, using the cover method you mentioned when eradicating buckthorn, do you purposely leave a large stem so it can be covered? Good question. You need a good, you saw in that picture, I would say probably four inches or five stump. They didn't look great to have this black thing, but it, it, in two years, the, the stump is gone. Um, you know, and that's to do it without herbicide. Jean and I, my husband and I also had a hedgerow of it that was just so thick and we needed to put shrubs in there and there's no way we could dig in all those roots for years. We wouldn't have been able to get a shovel in the ground with all those roots, even though we had used, if we would have used the back buckthorn. So we literally pulled it out like teeth. We hired Danny Rogers in Lake Bluff and he brought over his little bobcat skitter and we cut the buckthorn about 12 inches high and he could wrap a piece of chain around it and he, popped out the buckthorn by the root, just like a tooth. And then we could actually plant directly into that area after because the roots are all gone. If you're gonna, uh, you also can just cut it down and then grub out the top three inches under the ground to get the meristematic growing tissue. You need to get down three inches down into the root and upper growth parts of the buckthorn, like three, four inches, and then just put grass seed over it if you wanna just grass it. In our case, we wanted to put in shrubs, so we had to get the roots out. But I have friends who've just left the roots in place, grubbed out about three inches down so that it wouldn't re-sprout, and then planted grass. Because um, it will re-sprout from its roots if, you're not, if you don't do what I just suggested. And then you always have to watch out for the seed bank, because it'll re-sprout from berries for years. So those seeds last. Also, you can girdle buckthorn. You just leave it standing, but just girdle it. You can look that up how to girdle a tree and it dies in a year or two. And then it, there's no re-sprouting. It won't re-sprout and you just cut it down. So there, there are a bunch of ways to get up buckthorn. Um, are there, is that helpful? Do you want me to go into more detail or is that enough? Yeah, no, that's perfect. Thank you very much, Marian. That's awesome. You can always call me and we can go further into it. I, as, as you know, I've done a lot of buckthorn removal for the last 25 years, a whole yeah. lot. <laughs> Never so, ending, ending project. Yes, yes. Uh, but we need to end buckthorn in Lake County and Lake County Forest Reserve District is really trying. It is allelopathic. It puts out emodin in the soil, which is very hard on other plants. And it's hard on amphibians. 
It shades out other things. It's highly aggressive and moves into natural areas rapidly. We need to get rid of buckthorn. And we did right away. The first thing we did when we got in this property is get rid of the buckthorn. Okay, thank you. And uh, Oslin made a comment. Thank you for this wonderful presentations and lots of information and was wondering where that this is recorded. Yes, it is recorded and it should be posted on the Lake Forest Library's website in about 24 hours. So uh, you can call the library and inquire about it in 24 hours. Um, also from Greg, this was very informative and appreciate speaking directly about challenges in our area. Thank you, Marion. And then Joe, Joseph, uh, can these products be put on gout weed around perennials? Oh, gout weed. We talked about gout weed uh, with other questions. Let's hear that question again about gout weed and other, say again. This is, it says these products. I don't know what okay, products so particularly. Okay, so Natria and Weed Beater FE. Um, yes, they can be used around other perennials. You just have to be very careful not to hit because they're going to kill anything that's a broadleaf. Um, the natria, the vinegar, the burnout. So because they're going to hit anything that has a broad leaf, so any of your shrubs. So you do have to be careful when you're putting around other perennials. Um, and gout weed it is really tricky when you've got other perennials mixed in with gout weed. I literally lifted all of my native perennials and cleansed them washed all the roots off to get all the gut weed out, healed them in somewhere else until I clean the soil of gut weed and then put them back. So you sometimes have to lift the perennials that are valuable to you that have gut weed and then put them somewhere else until you, gut weed is really nasty and I wish they'd never given it to us. And some people will herbicide it. They make it very happy, get it going with water and fertilizer so it's really growing and then they'll hit it with a, 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 a spith, either triplocure, um, like Garlon 3A is what I would use, and just use a synthetic herbicide because it's that bad. I do use synthetic, I have a licensed herbicide applicator, I, full disclosure, I, so I know about herbicide, I use them in natural areas, and sometimes you just bite the bullet and use them. Gout weed is one of those things. We have it at Melody Preserve, it's all around that preserve, and we've been going after it with um, Garlon 3 for several years because it's just destroying so much. So yes, yeah, sometimes you have to herbicide, but I'm trying to give you guys organic uh, in your own yard where you have more time and less area to cover than we do in open lands to try these organic things first. You know, I never got to rodenticides, which are hugely important to me. I feel badly. Um, I could finish the recording with Kate later and type, take it on to this. Um, there, I, I wanted to tell you guys about rodenticides and what they do and the alternatives to rodenticides. Um, sorry, I didn't get there. Um, and also I had a whole bunch of home care cleaning products I didn't get to. <laughs> oh, oh, we'll just have to have you come back. I only got through two thirds. <laughs> well, this has just been great. And uh, we had some other comments about how helpful it was and also a comment that somebody was gonna take what they learned back to their condominium board. So I, I think that, yeah. too is really wonderful it's not um just individual homeowners it's people at businesses people who live in apartment buildings um who can talk to their land care services so. yeah i think I, it's all going this way i mean good enough even johnson and johnson now instead of putting out raid to kill yellow jackets and yellow and uh, paper wasps they now have a mint oil spray made by johnson and johnson they got the message <laughs> Uh, I think the more we start asking for st stuff like this, the more companies are going to respond to our requests. And it's just, just the pest control companies have a long way to go. So we have to start working with them and doing your homework and say, no, excuse me, I don't want that particular product. Couldn't you use this one for me instead? Um, and just do your homework. And I gave you all the resources you need to do your homework. So uh, we are going to be sending out a survey uh, probably tomorrow. And on that, again, if you have any other questions that weren't answered, you can put them um, on that form. And I will pass those along to Mary. And, and we cannot thank you enough for coming on. Uh, I want to stay and keep finishing. Anybody wants to stay with me. But Kate, you want to go home, too. <laughs> There's still so much good stuff left. <laughs> well, but, um, we probably, it would be 
more beneficial to have two sets of recordings. So what we could do oh, is we could set up another recording okay. and then post that to the YouTube and then we can send out an email and let everybody know. Okay, so, thank you. And they can just watch the second part that I missed at their leisure. Thank you. Let's do that. That's a great idea. We'll, we'll discuss that and we'll have a recording of part two. Oh, I thank you so much. And I thank all of you for trying to be good stewards. Thank you so much for your efforts and your concern. So we all help ourselves do a better job, <laughs> get the job done, but take care of our environment. So we'll let you all know what the date is for the second part of the recording and what topics that we'll cover. Okay, and good. Thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you, everybody. Marion. Sheraton, you wanted to ask about ground ivy. Hi. Yeah.